Now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Naomi Oreskes. Professor Oreskes is Professor of History and Science Studies at UC San Diego, Adjunct Professor of Geosciences at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and an internationally renowned historian of science. She received her BS with first class honors from Imperial College London, and a PhD in Geological Research and History of Science from Stanford University. Among her many awards and honors is being named the 2011 Climate Change Communicator of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Professor Naomi Oreskes. I love graduation. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you here today. But you graduated a difficult moment in an economic recession. This is not the first recession the United States has confronted, and it will surely not be the last. I also graduated in a recession. When I was a senior in college, graduating with a degree in geology, I wrote over 200 letters to mining and exploration companies around the globe and I received one full-time job offer, one. So I have some sense of what you are facing. And one of the problems you will face is the problem of realism. Tomorrow you will begin to make choices about where you will live, what work you will do, which advanced degrees you will pursue, or if you have already been admitted to graduate school, which specialty you will choose. And there will be many people advising you to be realistic. I advise you today to reject that advice. There is, of course, a time and place to be realistic. It's no use ignoring evidence in front of your face or neglecting life's real responsibilities and constraints. Not everyone can play for the Lakers or the Kings. Most people do not belong on American Idol. But what I am talking about is something else. It's the way realism is used to discourage those who think the world can be a different place, the way it is used to justify the status quo and deflate the ambitions of those among us who would be agents of change. Let me give you a concrete example. I am a historian of science who has worked on the history of climate science. I have tried to understand how scientists know that our planet is warming because of our activities and why this warming threatens the prosperity and well-being of humans around the globe, including here in California, as well as the very existence of many non-human species. But many people have resisted these scientific conclusions. It is hard to believe that our individual activities are so significant as to impact the entire planet. It is not pleasant to consider that our way of life is harming people who have not harmed us. And it is a very big job to change the way we generate the energy that runs our entire economy. So some people, rather than accept the scientific evidence, have tried to run away from it. Some people, rather than the con confront the truth, have tried to deny it. Happily, denial appears to be on the wane. But unhappily, it is being replaced in some corners with a different argument the argument that we have to be realistic. Changing the way we generate energy is just too big a task, these people say. We cannot stop using fossil fuels. We cannot ask people to change the way they live. And we particularly can't afford to do this now in a recession when so many people are unemployed or underemployed. But this argument is wrong. First. Thank you. We have the technology to make significant changes in the way we generate and use energy. And there are many reasons why a recession is a good time to make such changes. Much of the infrastructure of this great state of California was designed and built and financed during the Great Depression. We do not lack the scientific knowledge and engineering know-how. What we lack is leadership and political and personal will. Second, while scientists disagree about many things, they all agree that the likelihood of a very bad outcome increases as the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase too. 
So it's common sense to limit those gases as much as we can and to do it as soon as we can. The longer we wait, the more difficult and expensive the problem becomes to fix. Third, and what I'd most like you to think about the next time you hear someone advocating realism in any aspect of life is this. The argument for realism in dealing with climate change is an argument to justify the status quo. It is an excuse to resist change. And climate change is by no means unique in this respect. Now, change is not always necessary. There is no wiser adage than, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But when things are broken, when there is a documented problem in the world, then change becomes necessary. And this is where the issue of realism becomes thorny, entangled, and imperative. Consider the very history of this great nation. The United States was founded as a nation part enslaved. At the Constitutional Convention, there were bitter, bitter battles over whether a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal should permit one segment of its population to remain in bondage. Those who argued for the preservation of slavery insisted that its abolition was simply not realistic. Eighty years later, when Abraham Lincoln confronted the issue of emancipation, he once again faced the realist argument. How could slaves really be freed? It wasn't realistic, the realists argued, to think that uneducated, illiterate ex-slaves could suddenly become self-sufficient citizens of a republic. In some ways, the realists were right. Many ex-slaves struggled mightily to gain a toehold as free men and free women. But would any of them have preferred to remain enslaved? Did their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren ever regret that they had been liberated? I don't think so. It took nearly a century for the United States to abolish slavery and nearly another one to abolish its legal residua in enforced segregation, discrimination, and unequal protection under the law. When Martin Luther King marched on Washington, D.C. to try to destroy these residua, he too was told to be realistic. He was advised not to push too hard and not to expect too much. He was counseled to go slow. But it was his very unrealistic expectation, the outrageous belief that it was possible to have a country that practiced what it preached, a country where all men, and perhaps women, and maybe even people of diverse sexuality, were not just created equal, but treated equally. That wildly unrealistic expectation helped to create a new reality. And so the world does change. There is progress. And it comes in part by having unrealistic expectations. So understanding this, knowing the history of our great country, I encourage you to do two things. First, defend and protect this great experiment in public education of which you are a part. Universities are among the oldest and most durable institutions on earth. And among these durable institutions, none has made so much high quality education available to so many as the University of California. Today, this great experiment is under duress. So I ask you to support your university. Be loyal alumni. Join your alumni association. Donate time and money. And stand up for public education in public. Because the most expect effective spokesmen and women for this great university system are the students who have been educated in it. And second, as the University of California is a great experiment, let your own lives be experiments too. Don't allow anyone to stop you from doing what you want to do, what you can imagine doing, because it is unrealistic. Winston Churchill once said that an optimist believes that this is the best of all possible worlds, and a pessimist fears that it is. 
I have a different view. When I was in college laboring through differential calculus, and I didn't have a TA who made it fun, my best friend, Melanie Mitchell, and I made a discovery for which neither one of us has ever received proper credit. We solved the problem of whether the glass is half empty or half full. The answer is, it depends on whether you are drinking or pouring. For if you are drinking, you are draining that glass. But if you are pouring, you are filling it. And if you are filling it, then in that moment, that moment when that glass is just at that halfway point, that glass is indeed half full. It is not half empty. So to me, an optimist is a person who is pouring. An optimist is the person who is filling that glass. So today, tonight, and in the months, years, and decades to come, fill your glasses and fill the glasses of all of those around you. Congratulations and thank you very much.